Amen. You can be seated. Wow. God is so worthy of everything that we give him and that we honor him for. I want you to look at this. We're going to pray for a moment, but I want you to look at this as, as introduction today and move in a small profile, big influence. You see that on your, um, on your bulletin. When we go through God's word, there's some always heavy hitters out there, if you will. Moses, um, David, Samuel, Isaac, Jacob, all kind, Isaiah. There's all kind of big names, and we give them the honor they deserve. But, you know, there's a lot of people that you only get little glimpses of in life, in Scripture. But they, God used them for some amazing things. You know, most of us, most of us will exist in a world where we'll raise our families, we'll work, we'll do this, we'll, we'll do that, but we may never be on the front page of a newspaper or, or, or of a website. We'll never get this honor. We probably won't serve in Congress or in the White House or anything like that or be that great sports person. The world may not know us. But our community will know us. Our family will know us. And despite maybe what we call a small profile, we can have a big influence. And about the next two months, we're going to walk through some men and women from specifically the Old Testament that did that. And we're going to be encouraged by it. And we're going to start today with zeal. And in a few moments, you're going to hear a video from some of our folks, some of you guys that are defining that for us. So that's where we're headed. But before we get there, let, let's pray together and think of some things that are out there. Um, obviously, always international, national stuff. I know any time that um, a nation state rains weapons on another nation state, as we did with Syria, along with Britain and France the other day, that makes us nervous. Uh, and that's understandable. So be praying for, for international, national relations. But there's more than that. Pray for the condition of hearts and minds throughout our world. And, uh, and the desire to know God in a true and a loving way. And then you come home and there's always issues. We always have those of us that are hurting, those of us that are dealing with things. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's with, with our own health or the health of a loved one. There's always items for which we need to be praying. And one thing to be mindful of when you come in on a Sunday morning is there are prayer request forms that, uh, or prayer sheets, if you will, they come mainly from our Wednesday night ministry and putting th prayer needs together. And then they're there for you to take home and pray during the week if you'd like to. Because you may say, well, I don't, you know, I don't know what's going on. Well, that's a great way to stay, um, stay up on it. All right. Let's pray together. And after prayer, we're going to watch this little video. And then we're going to get in into this guy called Phineas. It's going to be interesting. But God's going to do some cool stuff if we'll let him. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, it is a beautiful day despite the impending rain. We thank you for that. And as we come before you now, Father... We come before you acknowledging that though we're blessed in so many ways, that sometimes life is difficult, and sometimes we don't see you in all your glory because we're so pulled down by, by life and our issues. But Father, today, we just praise you for allowing us to be here and worship this morning, that we've been able to, to lift up your name. Father, we've been able to, to celebrate the decision of a young man for you in Pearson. And now, Father, as we open your word, teach us, speak to us about zeal and about the impact that we can have in our own families and our own communities. But, Father, I do lift up what's going on in our own individual lives, in our community, Father, throughout our city and our state and our world. Father, that you do a work of life change and ministry in the human heart. And you change us through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, we give you this time together, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what kind of things do Christians be zealous about? Well, the thing that comes to my mind immediately is the fact that as a believer and follower of Christ, we should be zealous about just living for Him day after day after day. Prayer. I strongly believe in prayer. Don't move without prayer. <laughs> <laughs> so what does zeal mean? What does it mean to be zealous? Uh, to be, um, you know, to be zealous means to be forthright. It also means to be energetic and uh, very steadfast in what you want to do. It's my best. 
passion for Christ. <laughs> what does destructive zeal mean? Um, they're destroying it with, with like jealousy or zealousness. Probably someone who's very eager about the wrong cause and doesn't do anything to help it. What do you think? What do you think of when you hear the word zealous or a person who's a zealot? Someone who's very um, into their faith or whatever they're doing. Um, sounds kind of like jealous. Um, to hold dear almost with extremist beliefs. So, why do you think that some people do not seem to be zealous about their faith in Christ? They start to treat church like a country club instead of what it is. So should followers of Jesus be zealous? If so, what does that look like? Um, yes, they should be. And they should strongly follow their beliefs and what God's word says. Woohoo! Come with us! I'm going to heaven. Yes. Why do you think that? Because as a Christian you follow Jesus. Jesus was excited about God, so you should probably be excited about Jesus as your Savior. Um, they should be excited. They should be <laughs> zealous about and really excited about the fact that Jesus is risen. So, what are things that Christians need to be careful and not be too zealous about? I think that we can become too zealous. Uh, Sometimes in approaching people, we need to consider other people's feelings. We need to understand the background. You don't want to be over pushy with the faith and trying to get people to come to Christianity. It's a good thing to come to, but if someone doesn't want to come, you can't force them. Thanks for those that were able, allowed themselves to be put, had a camera shoved in their face on Wednesday night. And all the background, thank you, Stephen and Trish, for putting that together. Zeal. You heard some definitions. You heard some perspective. Here's going to be our working definition of zeal. Enthusiastic and diligent devotion in pursuit of a cause. Enthusiastic and diligent devotion in pursuit of a cause. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at and try to understand it. Now, zeal that is rightly motivated can do some great things. God can use it in profound ways. It can make a difference in, in people's lives and in communities. And so there's some good things there and, and brings insp inspiration. However, misplaced zeal can do great damage and great harm. And so there's always that balance of understanding what is what, how to live it out, and how to be careful. Because just as we see deep zeal lift people up, we've seen zeal, if we're honest, damage lives, communities, churches, even the kingdom of God. So we need to be very careful and very wise as followers of Christ as we walk through that. So today, we look at a very little-known priest by the name of Phineas, Phineas. He spelled it a little different than the, the verb character. And notice what we're looking at today. And that is a very important adjective to put there. God-honoring. Actually, zeal the verb, adverb. So God-honoring. Our zeal must be honor God. If we have zeal that does not honor God, we're doing great damage to people's lives, and we, and we can't. And so we want to be mindful of that. And so keep that there as we walk through. You see two passages. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 9, 20 first. It's just here. This is just a little bit of an introduction to Phineas. It says, he was the son of Eliezer, was ruler over them previously, and the Lord was with him. Let's leave that there. This finds itself in a, a re-chronicling, if you will, of the nation of Israel and some of their history there in 1 Chronicles chapter 9. And we find he was a ruler over the Levites, the keepers of the temple, if you will, the, and, and, and priests. And so he was involved in that ministry, and God was with him. And mainly, probably, he's mentioned here because of his zeal for keeping the sanctuary, the tabernacle of God, holy. And, and, and making sure that that, that that was there and he defended it. And that leads us to Numbers 25. So let's go to Numbers 25. We're not going to have, we'll have the passage on the screen, but not the text. Love for you. If you have a copy of God's Word with you, I'll be reading it. If not, there's one somewhere in that chair, either behind you or in front of you, if you'd like to grab a copy of God's Word and, and look at it. And so we're going to go to there and see zeal and how God is glorified. But let me 
Let me add some caveats as we get going. Um, the Old Testament is not for the faint of heart. If you want a modern-day understanding theatrically of the Old Testament, think Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones. Okay, yeah. Um, because of the violence, because of the things that happen. And so sometimes, if we're not careful, when we get into the Old Testament, it messes with our Western culture. It messes with our cultural mores because it just we, we see God, and it's God acting in certain ways that, we, that, that kind of disturb us, that we don't understand, and we try to get our minds around what is he doing. Because when we go to God's Word, it can be violent, it can be disturbing, it can be raw. You know, not only here in the first five books of the Old Testament, go to the book of, of Judges. We've talked about that before, and it's very raw, and you see all that. So it may, it may baffle us or confuse us a little bit. Also, when we look at what's going on today, history tells us that violence in the name of God often doesn't end well. We know that from looking at, at the history book. So you put all that together, and you say, how do I process this? How do I understand it? Here's how you, you do that. You take what God's teaching us in truth, and you don't get caught up in the other stuff. One of the tools of learning God's Word is don't let the things that we may be uncomfortable with and not understand to detract us from seeing the truth. Let, let God teach us the truth, and let's trust Him through some of the other things as we work through them. And that's what we see with a passage like this today as we, as we walk through it and as we, as we learn. And, and so we're going to look at that and see that. So let's go to chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. This is the most um, uncomfortable part of the passage. It sets up the context, okay? And uh, it's necessary as a pastor, as a preacher sometimes, you, you want to be careful with what you give people. Don't give people because of comfort levels and stuff. But sometimes you just got to preach what's in there because otherwise God's truth can't be gleaned if you don't do that. So we need to be about that. So... Chapter 25, verses 1 through 9, the nation of Israel has been for about 40 years now in the wilderness. They're getting on that arm, getting ready to, to head into the promised land. Okay, so they've organized, they have some function. Notice what we see here. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Now, God treats his covenant relationship with the people of Israel and with us as believers in Christ, as a marriage relationship, okay? And when we violate that, he equates it to adultery. So when you see that, that's what God is saying that they've done against him, okay? For they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the fierce anger, anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregations of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. A man of Israel goes, grabs a Midianite who he was unlawful to have a relationship with and basically flaunts it in the face of Moses and the people in front of the temple, basically taking his sin and saying, we'll do whatever the heck we want to do, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's what he's saying, okay? Verse 7, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman, through the body. So the plague on the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. Okay. What's going on here? Okay. First, they, they, they sinned. They violated God's word in two ways. God, when he made the covenant with them, said, listen, you can't hang out with other people from, 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 from Canaan. And from, they, they, they believe and they do things that will pull you away. You cannot be in covenant with them. If you do, you violate my relationship with you. They did that. They brought them in for their meals, for their worship, which ended up in them worshiping the wrong God, which violated the first commandment of God is have no other God before me. So they are an open, conscious disobedience to God, just open rebellion 
doing what they want to do. And we see not only did Moses respond, but Phineas responded as well. And what we see, notice what happens. Once Phineas responded for some reason, we don't know what's all going on, God pulled back his wrath. We're told a plague was sent. 24,000 people lost their life over this disobedience and over this behavior. And that, once again, that boggles our mind. We have a hard time. We see that and we're like, what the heck? You know, we, we have a hard time understanding that. But Phineas rested that, if you will. He, he, he stopped it through his zeal, through his obedience. Before we get into a couple of things, here's something you and I need to understand. Ser- holiness before God is serious business. God expects us to be holy. Not perfect. There's a difference. Perfect is I never make a mistake. Bump, bump, bump. You and I are incapable of that. The word holy means set apart. It means different. And we're set apart in holiness to be like God. And so we seek to, to mirror and show him in, in our actions. Now, in Christ, we love to be saved by grace. We love to talk about saved by grace. But we bring shame to ourselves and to that when we say we're saved by grace and we live like hell when we don't live like it, when there's no holiness before God. And that is a grave mistake that believers in Christ, you and me, the church make, is we love being saved by grace, but I don't know about that holiness business because I sure like to do certain things in my life. And I'd rather do them than be holy before God. And we got to be very careful with that because that is not what God calls us to. I want you to think about this, and then we're going to look at three lessons on grace. Grace has not changed the fact that God is holy and expects us to be holy. You go, for instance, into 1 Peter, and you go to some other places, and that is identified over and over again. There's an expectation that if I follow Jesus, I'm set apart, I'm different. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go to verses 10 through 13 of Numbers 25, and I'm going to pull out three lessons, if you will, of Phineas. And then we're going to talk, spend most of our time on what is the difference between healthy zeal and destructive zeal. Okay? What, what, what does it look like to be zealous for God in a way that is good, but what is it, what can be destructive in it? Okay? So let's go look at three lessons that I'm just going to pop through real quick in verses 10 through 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. Now, jealousy and zealousness are, are equated here. Similar word, envy, uh, fervor. So very, very similar understanding here. Uh, God uses them interchangeably. Therefore say, behold, I give him my covenant of peace, and it shall, shall be for him and his descendants after him, a covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Notice three things that Eleazar did, or that, that Phineas did. First, God honoring zeal overcomes sin. By him stepping in in the way that God led him to, it dealt with the sin of the nation of Israel. It, it, it stopped it, okay? And sometimes when you and I in the right way deal with an issue, step it on behalf of God, it can, it can see sin, it can overcome. That can be in a family relationship, that can be within the body of Christ, that can be with a neighbor, whatever. But when we're zealous that God's holiness gets right, we're going we're gonna to overcome some sin because we're going to step in and we're going to stop some things and God's going to use us and he's going to be glorified. Okay? The second thing that we see is God honoring zeal pursues God's priorities. Okay, now that's where the word jealous comes from. That word jealous used by God is a stumbling block for some people. Because when you and I, I don't know about you, but when I think about jealous sometimes, it kind of has a negative connotation. You know, if I'm jealous, if I'm envious, that means that, 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 that I'm selfish. That's not the context here. God, and he says it throughout his scripture, is jealous for you and me. He wants no one else to have a relationship with you more than he wants to have a relationship with you. He is jealous for you. He wants you. And so when I seek him that way, it, it makes me go after his priorities and what he wants to do. And then finally, it just, it just pleases God. We, we see this in, in 12 and 13. You know, Phineas protected the, um, the, the holiness of God. He dealt with it. Notice what God said. Hey, I'm going to give you a covenant of peace. That word peace in Hebrew means wholeness, security, prosperity. I'm going to bless you. 
with that. But I'm also going to give you a covenant of perpetual priesthood. Your family is going to be in that line of work. Your family is going to serve me in that way. So God saw what Phineas did, and, it brought, and, and, and so it pleased him, and he blessed him, and he put it before him. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a survey done by a man by the name of Tyler O'Neill. Josh and I were talking the other day, and, and he showed me this. And the title of it is 12 Lies American Evangelicals Believe. 12 Lies that, that, that and, and if he, you know, people define things differently, but, but that word evangelical basically would be some, what we believe. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross of our sins, that he's born of a virgin, that he rose on the third day, that he's coming again. All those beliefs that we hold dear. So that fits us. It would fit us and, and, and others of, of, of like faith with us. But he said there's 12 lies that we believe, and he goes through this series. Here's number three. We believe the lie that sin is not important. Sin is not important. Most people are good. This idea of damnation for what you did, I don't know about that. That sin is not important. In the face of a holy God and a holy Bible, that is a dangerous viewpoint because it's not based on truth. And we have to be very careful. And if we're, not, if, if we're not careful, this view can lead us to fall into a trap, even as followers of Christ. If I want to be zealous for God, if I want to be that enthusiastic, diligent, devoted person for the kingdom of God and for what God wants to do in my life, because remember when we go back to the beginning of Numbers 25, who these people are. They're the chosen people of God. They are in relationship with God. And they're like, I'll do whatever I want to. That's in the Hebrew, by the way. That, but anyway, we'll do whatever we want to do. And God says, time out. No, you don't. I'm full of grace. I'm full of mercy. I'm full of love. But there comes a line you do not cross. And if we're not careful as believers in Christ, we play grace so far that holiness does not mix in in our lives. And we're doing damage if that's our lifestyle. We're doing real damage to the kingdom and to others as well. And so we got to be careful with that. Um, I love this statement here that we need to be mindful of. You cannot have God-honoring zeal without being holy. If you or I say, I love God and I'm going to honor Him with all I do, and our lifestyle of how we talk, how we speak, how we abuse substance, how we abuse people, how we, how we conduct ourselves sexually. Sorry, let's be honest, folks. If they don't match up with Scripture, then, then we're missing the target. So we got to be very careful, and we got to be very understanding of what God is calling us to do. Now, here's what's interesting about Phineas. You had the nation of Israel, which he's a part of, but he wasn't a part of that mess. He kept himself separate, so he was able to step in and bring about the will of God. When you and I live separate, it gives us the ability to step in and honor God with our lives. Okay? Now, let's do this. We, we understand these lessons. We, we've seen Phineas. Now we're going to give most of our attention to the New Testament because we live under the covenant of Christ. We live under the authority of Christ. And now how do we play this out? And we're going to look at healthy zeal and destructive zeal. Okay? So let's look at that. We're going to be jumping around a little bit. For zeal to be healthy, it must be rooted in the sacrifice and the love of Christ. My enthusiasm, my devotion for God is because of what Christ has done for me. He has saved me. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I know where I was headed, and I know now where I'm headed because of Him. That is my foundation of healthy, healthy zeal and living for Him. And let's just notice three things that it does. First thing it does is healthy zeal protects God's holiness. Think about that. Now, some people say, well, it's not my job to protect the holiness of God. Uh, yes and no. God can protect himself. But if you name him, what right do you and I have to make him look bad? What right? You know, as, 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 as parents, what we tell our kids, one thing, you can do a lot of stuff. Do not make me look bad. I do that on my own. Don't make me look bad. Okay. Well, I think God has the right to say the same thing. Now, notice this. This is a, a passage we know. John chapter 2, verses 13. Jesus is 
going into Jerusalem. This is early in his ministry. There's a, di- a couple of different accounts of Jesus cleansing the temple. And this one and John, this particular one, is early. And notice what he's doing. The Passover of the Jews was near. Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. After, and he made a scourge of cords and drove them out all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said this, Take these things. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus walks in during Passover, holiest time of the year for, for Jewish population and for what they are worshiping. They go in there. They're, it's one thing to be selling things. They were doing it and do, being deceptive and making money off of it and bringing harm to the name of God. And Jesus got all up in them. Now, there's a fine line for you and me. Jesus can get all up in anybody he wants to because he's always going to be holy. You and I have to be careful because we, we love permission from God to be aggressive because aggressive is in our emotion and that's who we are as people. But we better be careful. There is a place for righteous anger, but there's a fine line between righteous anger and anger that makes me feel good that hey, I did it in God's name despite the fact I, quote, perverbially lopped that person's head off. So we've got to be very careful, but we are to protect the holiness of God. Next, healthy zeal honors God with how we live. I'm zealous for God. I love the Bible. I love to read the Bible. I love to study the Bible. And then you look at my life, and it looks like garbage. Notice this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself, notice this, a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Okay? Yeah, we should be zealous for the Word of God, but we should be zealous to do things that honor him. We should be zealous. You know, what, you know, what, is, what does Josh say periodically when he does our spoken benediction? You know, you know love your neighbor. Your, your, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. And that's what zealousness does. So if you're a person that you say, I love to, love, I love to study the Bible, I love to debate and do this, or, or what do your deeds say? And if your deeds do, ma- do not match up with that, there's something amiss. We need, to, we, need to, we need to check it. We need to watch it. Finally, healthy zeal deals with sin and therefore corrects our relationship with God. See, when I'm zealous, I'm going to see that sin in my life first before seeing someone else's. I'm going to correct it, and then it's going to heal that relationship. Notice in, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus through John is speaking to seven different churches. And this is a church in the city, a town called Laodicea, okay? And notice what he says. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You're a lukewarm Christian. You know what God's saying? You're distasteful. If, you're, if you can't make a choice, I.e., you're nasty. You're nasty. I bet you that's how God does it. But anyway, you're nasty to me. Because you're, you're, not, you're not taking a stand. You're not making a decision. You're, just, you're on the fence. You're a fence sitter. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know what you're wretched, that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. And white garments so you may clothe yourself. And that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be what? Zealous and repent. He's saying, if I'm, if, and today, if God is convicting you about something and pushing you about something sin related, that's, that's good news for you and me because it's mean He's disciplining us, He's working us, He wants to draw us back. Be zealous and repent. Be devoted, be enthusiastic, and get back in relationship 
with me. A couple ideas on developing healthy zeal. Our, we need to be motivated by our salvation. Our salvation is to motivate us. If you've been saved, you've been brought out of eternal hell into eternal relationship with Christ. That should motivate our salvation and, the, and motivate our passion. Motivated by truth, not emotion. All of us know that, it, boy, emotion, it's easy for emotion to motivate us and get zealous about stuff. We get all hyped up. And that's okay. that has its place. But true zeal is motivated by the truth of God, not emotion. Because emotion can, can take us down the wrong road, and we need to be, be careful of that. And so we obey, we serve, we give. We're all in for what God has called us to do. That's healthy zeal. Now, what's destructive zeal? Let's work this out as we look at this and just a couple of things, and then we're going to tie it all together and see what God's doing today. The focus of it is absent of the love and sacrifice of Christ at its core. We're more interested in other things at our core than the love of Christ and his sacrifice. So notice this, destructive zeal is not rooted in the truth of Scripture. Okay? Look at the verse, Romans 10, 2. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. I want you to hear that. If we're not careful, we can be zealous for God, but not because of the truth. Not because of what, we're, what we know is gospel, but because of something else. And when we are motivated by something other than truth, we're, we're likely to do damage. And the reason we're going to do damage is because we're going to take the wrong action, an action that God doesn't want us to take. Okay? And so we need to be careful. Here's, here's what we do. We act like Phineas when God has not asked us to act like Phineas. We decide to take up the proverbial sword and the proverbial spear and start scouring, just getting people. And God's like, no, I, I didn't ask you to do that. So we've got to be careful. Okay? Now, also, destructive zeal fights the wrong battles. Okay? This is one I want us to really think about. The person here is Simon the Zealot. If you look at Luke 16, 15. This is just a partial list of the apostles, and Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot. Now notice that, capital Z, not, not lowercase. So therefore, that's a name, that's a moniker for something. In the New Testament, a Zealot was a person that was all in for the nation of Israel, okay? That they were, they, they were all in for it coming back to its kingdom, coming back to its glory, if you will. And so as a result of that, they were, they, they were nationalist, Okay? We're familiar with that term. So they're, they're nationalists and they're bent. Very anti-Rome. Rome controlled Jerusalem at the time and that whole area of Judea. So a zealot in context historically was anti-Rome, big time Jerusalem. So when Simon the Zealot, more than likely, though he under, ended up understanding Christ and walking with him, he probably was drawn to Christ because of the Messiah complex. Okay, this is the guy that's going to be the king again. So I'm all in for that. Today, an insurgent. We hear that, those words a lot. Some people might, for a zealot, use the word terrorist. We hear that word a lot. You notice how that fits into our vernacular and our understanding a little bit better. Okay, So here is what he was about. He was, at, at first, that, that idea is wrongly motivated, misplaced. Now, let me be honest with you. Next couple things I mentioned, I want you to think about in your daily walk and daily dealing with people. I'm going to talk about areas where we're misplaced, ways we're misplaced, and ways we do it. Okay? So I want, I want you to hear me on this. Our politics. People, politics are killing us. I don't need to tell you that. But the way we're dealing with politics in our nation is doing great damage. And the way at times churches deal with politics is doing great damage, okay? Didn't say you can't be political. All of us have a political system. Have a few, okay, not saying that. Can't say you can't stand for it. It's about how we deal. Not what you say, it's how you say it. Politics is often wrong and misplaced. Social issues, cultural issues. Once again, we're the body of Christ, we're to stand for truth. We're to stand for love. We're to stand for, for sanctity of life and purity. I understand that. But sometimes that's our 
priority, and it's getting us in trouble. Now, this isn't easy. This is a softball. It's sports. Now, we like to have fun in sports, and, and we banner around some of us. And I think for the most part, though we've had our moments, I, th- I think most, I th- to be honest with you, I will be fair, I think we, we do okay with that now here. But there are some places that sports is all about in your face. And when that happens in church, you got to be careful with that. Let's talk about the church. Okay? Sometimes we're wrongly motivated in our zeal for tradition. We're wrongly motivated in our zeal for our buildings and what they should look like or not look like. We're wrongly motivated in our, in our, in our perspective on music, what worship style, be it contemporary. doesn't matter the style. So if you're saying, well, he's picking, I'm not picking on anybody. Be it hymn-based, be it contemporary-based. But I am telling you this. If you or I can only worship God with a particular music style, there is something wrong with our relationship with God. Because it's not about the word. It's not about truth. It's about style. Style will burn up in hell. Style does not matter. And it, it, it's, it does damage. So that doesn't mean you don't work on things and work together. But I'm telling you, if you can't worship unless there's a certain style, there's something wrong in your worship. I'm going to call you out on that, okay? Because we've got to be careful there. And, and there's all kinds of things we can throw in there. But folks, here's something that I've noticed over time I want you to think about. The more zealous we are in the wrong battles, the less zealous we are in the right battles. I want you to hear that. The more zealous we are for politics, for tradition and music style, for buildings, for sports, for social issues, the less zealous we are to reach a community that's lost the less zealous we are to make sacrifices for the cause of Christ, the less zealous we are to do what God in his word would have us to do. I know this because I watch it all the time, and I've even fell victim to it. So we've got to be careful. Because you can't be zealous for this and be wrong about it and zealous for the right. It it doesn't mix, and it's not, not going to mix. So... What can we do? I want to encourage you. But here's some areas. Stay off your high horse on social media if you claim to be a believer in Christ when it comes to politics and other issues. Folks, I'm on Facebook, but I hardly ever post. And I've seen things posted by believers in Christ that are so politically divisive so culturally divisive that all there are is there's arguments. Why am I going to put that out there? Why am I going to do that? If my motivation is the kingdom, I'm going to be careful. If my motivation is I want you to vote for this politician or that or I want to rip that politician or that politician or whatever, you can do that. You have freedom. It's called the First Amendment. you're no longer being obedient to the cause of Christ if you're doing it for those purposes. It's social media. We have to watch gossip, stirring the pot. Okay? If we like to sit in the background and just talk and we're zealous about ripping people, you're doing damage. No one's doing good. If, if what you're saying is so important, go to the people that matter that can solve the problem and talk to them about it. If not... You can tell I'm kind of passionate about this, and I am because I see the damage we're doing within the body of Christ when our zeal does not meet the truth of the gospel, and that's what we need to be careful of and understand. Prayer, right motives, right priorities, and even when we need to, keep them quiet and keep us out of that. Okay. Phineas. All he did was stand there and watch the nation of Israel completely obliterating its faithfulness to God. He said, this is not right. This must be dealt with. And in my holy zeal, I'm going to deal with it. 
and he did. For you and me, we need to decide what's my faith life in Christ going to be about. Am I going to live and pursue a zeal that is based in my relationship with Christ, based on the love and truth of the gospel? And now, is it easy? No. It's hard. We're passionate about our politics. We're passionate about our sports. We're passionate that we're right all the time. I understand that. But remember, our goal is maturity. And if we will pursue that, God will work in us. God will move in our families. He'll move in our community. He'll move in our church. He'll move in our world. He'll move in his kingdom. So here's a challenge for you and me today. Small profile. The world may not know you and I very well. They're not going to hear about us. But you know who's going to hear about us? Our families are going to hear about us. Our community is going to hear about us. You know, they're going to know us. And we can have a great big influence. Let's do it the right way with the right zeal that honors God. So here's how we start today. We're just going to worship here in a moment. As we do, if, if it starts with the relationship with Christ, if you've never made that step of faith, we are here to walk with you through that. Pastor Josh and me are going to be up here. We're here to walk with you, to talk to you about that, to pray with you and praise God with you over that. So I'd love for you to come talk to us about it. Or if you're a little nervous about that, but you're ready to move forward, the communication card that Pastor Josh mentioned, write it on there, put it in the offering plate, and we will be talking to you post-haste. We'll get after it, okay? Maybe you're ready to fall in believer's baptism. What a great act of, of zeal and enthusiasm. Come and tell us, or once again, put that on the card and let God work. Or maybe you just need to pray. Pray about your zeal or pray about what's going on. Uh, Josh and I will be here. Amy will be here to pray as well. We'll be up front. And during this time of response, it's the time to pray. It's the time to worship. It's the time to respond. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Uh, the worship team's going to gather. Give them a moment as they get in place. But God's zeal cannot be denied. And God wants us to live in that way. How do you need to match your heart and your life up with what he's saying today?